All right. First clap. On three. One, two, three. What's up, everybody? Welcome to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're so glad that you're here. As always, I am your host, Lauren Ash. And as always, I am joined by my co-hostess with the most S, Christy Oxborough. How you feeling? I I feel like it's been forever since we've done this. It's been a minute because we had to bank a few because there's been so much going on. So much. Uh, and I was thinking that, too, that that we um, we haven't recorded in, in, in a minute. And right before we we pressed record, I have had I've had the longest month, arguably, of my life in the best way. But I'm yes. exhausted. And and uh, so we were chatting and then I was like, this is great. Like, I'm so excited now. Like, we, you know, the, the ray of sunshine in my life that is Christy Oxford has perked me up. I'm ready to go. And the last thing I said was, let's go. Let's create. Let's do our art. <laughs> I I couldn't be happier. Yeah. And this is this is what we've discovered. We never just do like a open the Zoom go, "Hey, okay, you ready?" We take some time, usually half hour, yeah. usually hour. Yeah. Just chit-chat and chat about things, things that we've already texted about that day. Oh, we yeah. chat about everything. Everything we're not done yet. We haven't no. gone through it in detail. And this is where we've got her. We've got her over enunciating, which is where I want her to be. Of course. So I, I couldn't be happier. Because uh, really, I mean, God, it's been a while. It has. This because is our we've... first one for February, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Jesus. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> because. <coughs> oh, God. Oh. And I'm also, I'm, I'm chugging a warm Diet Coke, which I know. Why oh, warm, Lauren? Live. I'm not great at stocking the fridge. I forget mm. to do it. And then I want one and I don't want to put it on ice. Don't ask me why. Anyway, but it's making me a little belchy. So I apologize now, dear listeners, if you hear me, give a little, give a little. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love the silent burp and just the, as it's like <laughs> out the side of the mouth. Yeah. Um, But there's, I mean, listen, there's been so much going on in our lives because obviously yeah. I had a birthday. You did. It was you a damn birthday. well did. I damn well did. I uh, so Christy was here, I was. and that's why we had to bank bank episodes because she came here. I threw a giant birthday party in L.A., and yeah. then the next day we a group of um, us two and ten other friends of mine uh, went off to Vegas. We were there for two nights. Then I got back. I shot a day on a movie. Then the next day, I flew to Atlanta. I was there for a day and a half doing the SCAD television festival for my new show, Not Dead Yet, which is currently airing on ABCs on Wednesday nights at 9.30 p.m., 8.30 Central. And mm -hmm. then I did a full day of work and then got back on a plane and flew back here. The long story short is I don't know how I'm standing because then I had a, I had a weekend and then I did Jimmy Kimmel yesterday. Yes. So it's just been – it kind of been as un unrelenting. But, but there's, like, again, so much going on. Um, that yeah, we realized at the top of the year that we had to bank episodes because there was just going to be no physical time. And yes. we also, I mean, we went for it in Vegas to a level that there was talks about us recording like the day after we would have gotten home from Vegas. And I just want to say, thank God. <laughs> thank God that we weren't like, yeah. that's the move. Oh, I, I couldn't have been happier. Uh, the, the, the almost, I would use the word selfish part of me was like, I got to make sure we're not recording that day. I don't want to, I don't want to do work on the plane. Well, joke is I brought work to do on the plane for this episode. Um, but, uh, most of that, <laughs> that plane ride, cause I have to do, uh, two flights cause it's not direct. Yeah. Uh, most most of that was me crawling into my seat and looking at my seatmate and going, "I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just so over," <laughs> and pulling my hood up and just like resting. Like that second flight was a very lovely gentleman sitting beside me. We had some conversation. It was lovely, and then I grabbed my backpack from under the seat and I put it against the window and I stuck my arm through so that once I fell asleep, my dead arm would catch in the straps of my backpack and I fell asleep fairly certain I snored um it, it was it was bad 
And then the flight before that, I fell asleep. And I jerked awake, you know, like you fall asleep and you it's like you're falling and then your whole body jerks. I scared the shit out of the poor woman sitting beside me. And she went, I think she thinks I was having a seizure because she's like, oh, my God, have some water, have some water. And I went, no, 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 no. It's OK. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm just really hungover. And she went, I'm working on it and raised <laughs> a glass of wine. <laughs> I was like, we were we were meant to sit together. Um so yeah, not a ton of work got done uh, on the plane. I would have done some in the airports, but not a lot of time in between. Yeah. It was me racing from one flight to the other and then shoveling piping hot chicken tenders down my throat so I could have them done before I get on the plane. But um, geez, yeah, I was I was in rough shape for multiple days after. I was like, oh, I'm... I think mentally still there. Like it was, Oh yeah. It was, it was rough. It was, it was a rough one. Have I already been in contact with my contact at the hotel about another visit to Vegas? Maybe, maybe of course I, um, no, I absolutely crossed over on that trip. I mean, there is a great side by side photo that I've made of me, uh, like how it started, how, how it, it ended. Started. Yeah. How was, and how, how it started, started was like... me wearing a full skims, I'm talking Kim K. Yeah. One piece jumpsuit, heels, yep. faux fur coat. Never wear real fur ever, obviously. Um, sunglasses, like me arriving to the airport to go to Vegas, impossibly fresh and beautiful. Yes. And then next to it is me getting off the plane back in LA at the end of the trip, <laughs> carrying a bag of my own vomit. <laughs> and I... I've told yeah. this story a couple times to people and they get horrified. And I was like, is it horrifying for me to take my trash being something that was expelled from my body instead of expecting a flight attendant to deal with it? I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry that I'm so gross that I had to carry <laughs> my my vomit off the plane to a garbage can like a kind, thoughtful human. Take that shade. You know what I'm saying? I, I, like, I like the addition of um uh, i think it's lovely of you um to clean up after yourself it's very canadian sealed i walked with it for like i don't know 15 paces then it went to a trash can like it wasn't like i was like carrying it around for a day i didn't put it in my purse that's worse i'm sorry that i care about the flight attendants like i care about them that's nice. i do they have that's... a hard job they do it's not it's not great they that do. job but one little Peccadillo, if I may. <laughs> Again, very hungover. I fell asleep. I am a very, very anxious flyer. So if I sleep, leave me alone. Yeah. Thank God I'm asleep. I'm passing time. She woke me. No. To ask if I wanted food. And I was like, no. ma'am. Ma'am. No, thank you. <laughs> I was like, no. Thank you. Uh, what made it worse, and this is no fault of hers. Yeah. Um, I was wearing a hoodie, so she wouldn't know. She gave me a real, like, two-finger, really hard tap-tap on my arm, right where I got a fresh tattoo in Vegas. Oh. Yeah, that's, that's, wrong. On, that's on me for making the choices that I do. Um, Here's what I'm going to say. It, it that's not on me. you. It woke me to my core, I was. She not doesn't need to be touching it. you. She doesn't need to touch. Oh, it, I wasn't happy. Um, and the second flight, when I like made that backpack arm sling situation, um, I do believe they pushed my knee to try and get my attention, but I didn't even bother opening my eyes. Then don't like, wake her. I'm gonna tell you a little something. This is yeah. a case by case because on my sure. way to Atlanta, I was out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Other than when there was a baby who was screaming. Uh and look, I have nothing but sympathy. Well, I have sympathy. Okay. But here's yeah. what it was for me was the mom, I almost got up and picked up that baby and started to walk it around. Because the 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 mother was alone and I think overwrought, and she just she didn't take the baby out of its carrier. So it just screamed in its carrier. Oh. And I was like, this child just needs to be held. Like, just pick it up. Pick it up. Pick up the baby. Like, I was just starting to lose sure. it. Um, 
if she's walking around and it's still crying, listen, it could be call, it could be whatever. But but to me, it was sure. just like she seemed like she was just so. And again, I can have compassion for that, but I also can have compassion for myself and for that baby. Pick up the baby. The baby needs to be held anyway. Um, but I was in and out as much as possible. And then it was, you know, half an hour to landing. And I kind of was like sitting up and the flight attendant came and said, uh, cause it was a work trip it was being paid for. And so it was sure. like, we, we had a breakfast for you. It's cold. Do you want it now? <laughs> and I said, yes. <laughs> and part of it was because I didn't want it to go to waste. And the other part of it was that I was, res I was respectful and thankful that they didn't wake me. They let me sleep yeah. in my half awake, half looking at the crying baby sleep, you know? Yeah. And that's the thing. I didn't need the food. I didn't take the food. And guess what? If you come through and you're like, uh-oh, Susie sleep over there. Yep. Gonna leave her. Yep. And I wake up an hour later starving. Yep. And I'm like, I missed that. Guess what, Christy? You missed out. You should have said, saved your sleepy snores for after the meal. <laughs> well, and again, but if you were on this flight with me, you would have been in a great position because you could have said, is that available? And they would have said, we saved it for you. We wanted to let you rest. I think, And I think that's great. Yeah, I think it's great they let you rest. I also love, oh God, I pray uh, that this isn't the one she starts with. But uh, my seatmate on the, on the second flight, um, it was like that casual, like, so what do you do for a living? Whatever. Sure. Um, it turns out that I left any filter I may have had, which I've barely had one. I, I left it in Vegas somewhere. Yeah. Um, so I literally said, like, he was telling me about his job, which felt very grown up and impressive. Sure. And he, he asked me and I was like, oh, ah, it always feels awkward to say. And I literally said to him, no, wait. I shouldn't feel awkward about it. We're really good at it. I actually co-host a podcast. <laughs> yes. Just very boldly. We're actually really good at it. So uh, I co-host a podcast and he was like, oh, no kidding. And I was like, yeah, it's a true crime thing, whatever. That we, we had a couple of jokes um, and then I like zonked, whatever. Flights ended. We're getting ready. We're going to leave the plane. And he go he just goes, Oh, by the way, uh, what's what's the name of that uh, of that podcast you do? So I told him, of course. And he's like, I will tell my wife, uh, because she's into that kind of thing, whatever. And so I just went, Oh, that's so sweet. Oh God, let her know we're not for everyone. <laughs> Which one, Christy? I think he's figured that out by now. Where he got to witness, like that was pretty bad me on the flight and like the amount of times I was like I'm just I'm just so hungover <laughs> it was like but of course he didn't know where I was coming from because we were in we were in Toronto so he was just like wow she had a great time in Toronto and what I should have just said was sir I'm, I'm coming from Vegas <laughs> is what yeah. I should have said and then he would have gone ah uh, there it is there yeah it is. but yeah it, it, I just if, also if have to say is listening Bless you for giving it a shot, and welcome. Your husband is a gem, and I did, I did say uh, that she that his wife was my hero, multiple times. Because he, he said nothing but loving things about her. Oh, oh I love no. that I was like he seemed difficult. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was actually very lovely. Uh, he told me a story. So we got in very quickly about like having children and whatever, and he commented. Oh, I think I said I was coming from like a girls' trip. And he said that his wife took a girl's trip for a weekend, like a three-day weekend, long weekend or something. Uh, and she went to New York. And as she was leaving, she uh, she made a comment about like, oh, by the way, um, now's probably the perfect time to potty train our child. Love you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I was like, God damn it, man. Your wife's my hero. <laughs> it's like, that's that's so beautiful. Um the joke is that moments before he, I I think the very first thing I said to him was, I'm so sorry, I am so hungover. Uh, and his he made some sort of comment about, I've potty trained a child, so anything right. goes. And I was like, sir, once I'm in my seat, I'm not going to bug you to get out. I'm just in there. And he was like, I've potty trained a kid, whatever. And I went, ooh, you're my hero. 
And then he made this comment about his wife was like, you should do that while I'm gone. And I said, I'm so sorry about what I said earlier. I was wrong. Your wife's my hero. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we had some laughs and whatever. And uh, he was he was very lovely and he was very kind uh, about his words about his wife. So it was very sweet. I love and that. I also have to say this move that you pulled with the backpack and putting your arm through so you don't get a dead arm. Innovation. Oh, I'm going to say it also. That backpack, so comfortable. It was basically I like I brought my pillow. And what backpack was it? It was something you can find on TrueCrewMerch.com. The only place for True Crew merch. That's not the words I meant to say. Uh, yeah, look, I I will shout about us till uh, the cows come home. But that backpack, it's got a nice padded on the back. So it when does. you're traveling, it's nice. It's got a little security pocket at the back that I like. Uh, it's a good yeah, quality. It is. And yeah. I, I picked that sucker up because I knew my, there was space between the seat and the the side of the plane, not enough that I could just lean over yep. nicely. And so I'm like, well, shit, I need something in there. And so I'm like, well, if I put my backpack in there, but I'm like, my arm will just, and then my arm will drop and I'll have another jerk situation where my seatmate will think I'm having a seizure. So I'm like, how do I save that problem? Sling. I put my <laughs> arm in that sling. Light sling. I, it it Plain worked. sling. Plain sling. Yeah, Come it on. was nice. No. No, the name of it, the Sky Sling. Oh, I like that. That's better right? than my what I was just thinking of sleeve sling. <laughs> Is that that just sounds like I'm drunk? It's a sleeve sling. Like that just sounds like a mess. The point is, I might still be in mentally some problems from oh. Vegas. It was. I like I my blood alcohol hall level right now if I was tested they'd be like you shouldn't be driving like it feels like I haven't drank in <laughs> days and it's like oh yeah she's not well not well at all um yeah, it was just it was just flowing Elvino did flow yeah. and look I was told prior to this trip that someone maybe the birthday girl maybe not um Really wanted people to just go for it. And so I I showed up that first night and I drank oh. a bottle and a half, a liter and a half to myself. She did. And I, I, I was even asked the next day, like, wow, you weren't even drunk. And I was like, I was loaded. Are you kidding me? I was so drunk. But, you know. I, you know, it's funny because yeah. when I said that, I didn't like, I didn't mean that people needed to like, put their health on the line or <laughs> um mm -hmm. you know i wasn't like ooh you better you'd better yeah. uh but what i love is that yeah you came you came to play you played hard you left it all it, on the field and i respect that in, in a human being more than almost any other trait uh my only problem i came in too hot at the beginning so i set a level a precedence right. of what is expected of me for the weekend and i feel like i kept it up you did. I really did. You raised uh, to your own To the point level. where I somehow, uh, I wore a pair of boots at one point that I fucking love, but they destroyed the back of my heels. Like, it looks like, it looks like a serial killer was under my bed and slashed my heels with <laughs> Oh my God! Because it's just like fully across. And so I've had to have like very serious bandage situations for days uh, to try and help it. But because... I because while I was walking partway through, I I thought I would only be in those boots for so long. I was in them for over eight hours. And so I walked, I guess, a little differently in them. So now I've somehow fucked up a knee. It's amazing. <laughs> oh yeah, I full, full mess. But great news, the pink coat, the infamous pink coat, yeah, came out. It came out to play. And that's when we know shit's getting real. Yeah. It also might have been the dancing at at Latin night that fucked the knee. Yeah, it was Latin night at Omnia, and we we went for it. We, we did. went for it. There was also they would spray every so often what looked to be like some sort of dry ice, and it smelled weird. And we were both like, I don't think that this is good to breathe, but it feels great. <laughs> oh, it's what you not. It's not what you want chemically, but no. it's what you want physically. Yeah. Be, like the first couple of times it happened, I'm like, what is going on? But you're, you're dancing, you're in it and you're so, so hot. And all of a sudden that cold ice just 
the fog rolls past you and away you go. You're I mean, that's, oh ice. my God, that's where the zombie bit is going to start. Yeah. That's going to turn everyone. Yeah. Well, that's the way to do it. Because it goes that whole, through that whole place. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. And look, I mean, I have never consumed that much alcohol probably in my life that I consumed in those, like, four days. Yeah. Um, and I've also never been spoken to as vilely as I was. I don't even know that we can repeat what he said. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm shocked you're yeah. bringing it up because it is bad. It's oh, it's so bad. Like uh, the thing, like it, it's that moment though where you're just like part of you is like, I'm almost flattered, but oh, gross! It was, it was, it was gross. It was gross. Christy got Christied. It happens. Oh, I got. It always happens to you. I got, I got. Well, the, and the joke is they were the the gentleman was hitting on friend of the podcast Leslie Seiler. That's correct. And then he turned to me. <laughs> And decided, no, no, I'm setting my sights on on that boozy broad. Um, to the point where the next night I was like, I was so verbally violated that night <laughs> that I decided the next day, no shapewear. I'm going to take it down a notch on the makeup. <laughs> I'm going to care less. <laughs> I, I brought really cute heels to wear with this dress. I'm wearing running shoes. <laughs> I was like, try less. Because I, I didn't need that. Nobody needed that. No, no, it was that was illegal. <laughs> it was vile. It was awful. Look, it was, but there is a small part of me that wants to go. Still got it. <laughs> hey, I think if anything, we know that that has always been the case. Always been the case. Look, um, he, didn't go, he didn't cross lanes of traffic to talk to me, but. But he would have. <laughs> I've seen it happen. I'll see it. I've seen it happen before, and I'll see it happen again. And that's a gift to me. Oh, can you always think, oh, God, she's had children since all of that kind of thing happened. There's no way. There's no way it's going to happen. And then they get one look at your ass, and they're like, damn. And I think you need to really rewire how your brain is working there because it, they they sense your aura. They sense the blanche. You can't not. You're always putting out the blanche, whether yeah. you know it or not. Yeah, look, um, Blanche, Blanche had a time. I don't yeah. know if we should get into that part, but Blanche had a, didn't, Blanche shut down. <laughs> Blanche. <laughs> didn't know i'd save that for patreon but yeah go keep keep going blanche didn't know how to handle things we went to a a show we'll say we won't get too deep in it yeah. uh but we went to a show um and we were a large group 12, 12 women, women. yeah um so when we were taking cars places it was always like oh we're gonna get split up into groups of three or four yes um i also realized this trip i saw you less than probably I know. anybody else in this thing because it was you just kind of tended to stick with your smaller group and whatever and yeah i ended up we shared we shared a goddamn bed on that trip and i we somehow did. saw you less i know then but the, but i thought it was nice was that everybody would kind of stick into their smaller group but the groups kept changing like it was like a constant yes. it was like nobody Ever was changing. set in a group it was just that everybody was commingling and so it was constantly you know shaking up and i liked that yeah i liked that it felt very um inclusive that way because what i'll say to you honestly is i don't feel like i saw anybody on that trip <laughs> like i feel like it was like fragments of moments yeah. you know glued together poorly like it doesn't feel i don't feel like it was like oh and then i had a really nice moment with so and so like it was just it was chaos sure. we hit the ground it running was. and it was chaos to the last possible second you know it was uh and that's the thing we did that show on the last night we were there we did and i have never shockingly i have never been to any sort of male review before yeah um the only bit i really want to get into is is the is the pre photos of course now i've never been to anything like this i did not know what to expect sure. we were my group the we were the first ones to arrive to the area and they were like hey 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 they're doing photos with these two yahoos over here and i was like who are these guys and they're like well they're the guys that are supposed to get you excited and rope you into going to that show. Um, we we were already going, but okay. And they're like, well, you want to take photos? And I was like, I, I don't think I need this. So they bring us in. 
And this one guy, who's like exactly my height, looks looks us in the eye and goes, so which one of you's the naughtiest one? And I was like, what's <laughs> happening? And I like I didn't go Blanche. These are these are shirtless men just in jeans. Yep. Shirtless men. Very they spend a lot of time at the gym. But somehow instead of Blanche, I was more of a Dorothy because I was like, sir, what? And so of course the the l- lovely ladies that I'm with said me. They said it's her. She's the naughty one. I'm like, oh, of course, here we go. And that guy steps up. So we are touching noses, nose to nose with each other. And he just goes, I can tell it's why she's wearing the choker. And I was like, what? I was like, sir, I don't know, sir. And then without consent, they were like, we're going to do this photo. Come back with us. Come back with us. Sit here. Do this. Put your hand here. And next thing I know, these two men have locked their arms underneath me and they hoist me into the air. I fucking shrieked because I didn't know that was going to happen and because they didn't have time to adjust where their hands were. And so hands like went up that dress and I was like, sir, no, this is not. Yeah. I was like, this is not a thing. So uh, we, we get, they put me down on the ground. I'm like, okay, that's great. Let's get, let's go. And that guy again comes over, gets super close to me and goes, so you having my baby in nine months? And I just Jesus. went, I, I literally said, sir, I am fixed, sir. I'm done with children. I said, that's, that's your, that's your <laughs> girl clutch. Well, I was just like, you don't, what are we doing, sir? I was like, stop it. I'm probably old enough to be his mother. Like as like, mm. if I was like a teen pregnancy, Ooh. I, if I was like 15, Ooh, 16, yeah. I probably yeah. could have given birth to that guy which is where my problem started, I think. Cause I was like, he's too young. Yeah. He's too young for this. And then he was oh, like, listen, I, I bet get she shy too. choking. And I was like, fuck, sir, no. Ooh. But I kept calling him sir to try and like make him seem older. But I was like, no, no, no. And then there was a moment where everybody had showed up. They all did their like group photos. And then they were like, let's do one of everybody. I was like, I can't go near these men again. And so I'm discussing buying these photos with the person that worked there. And they're all calling me over. They're like, come on join the photo and i was like do you think if i keep talking to you they'll realize i'm not interested in being oh well also i've got to give you my point of view so i was in one of the final groups to show up and then we go in and we see what's happening and i run i'm in heels and i'm running i'm like we have to be there and then i who also has had a little bit to drink at this point yell buy all the photos i don't care the cost like literally i I, because i hadn't seen anything that had happened and i was like i want all of this i have no idea how much money we spent on souvenir photos that night, but let's just say we've got, we've got photos for days. so many, um, so many, but then, so then they, I had the birthday sash on. So then they were, yeah. they were giving me their, you know, whatever Royal treatment, like they mm-hmm. gave you. And then at one point it was like, Christy, get in the photo. And I turned and I looked at her and she, <laughs> in the moment you're describing, you turned and just met eyes with me. And I said, let her go, let her go. <laughs> I knew, I knew. I was like, she's overstimulated. Something's happened. Like she doesn't want in this picture. Don't, yeah. don't force her. And I was like, take the photo without her. Yeah. Uh, and look, in the end, we amazing. have a group shot of all of us with a group we shot do. of all the men. We so do. we have a shot that we but, got later in the night. Yes. Yes. Which I know in the moment we did not know was going to happen, but we do have it. We do. So I don't have to feel bad. Uh, you, about you don't need to like, feel bad. I, I'm like, I can't get near this man who's going to be like, when are we having a baby? And it's like, that would be my grandchild. Go away. <laughs> I also I also felt like, you know, most of that guy's bits, no shade. I mean, listen, um, he's an artist, but it most of his bits were about like impregnation, impregnating, like, yeah. impregnating and stuff. Yeah. And I was like, I don't know if you know what the female experience is, sir, because I think for sure. us, like the idea for, for any of those women... Yeah. Um, that we would be pregnant by you at the end of that night. That's not a fun fantasy. That's not no. a fun fantasy at all. No, that's a, no, that's sir. a, that's a, oh God, I have, <laughs> I have to re reevaluate my life choices moment. You know what I mean? What I would like, and I may get comments for this, but I stand by it. What I'd like is if he had his storylines for specific ages, under 40, over 40, over 40, <laughs> leave the baby stuff at home choose your own adventure he should be but you know what maybe we just looked young 
I mean, your sash said I'm 40. Didn't well, it? here's the thing. Well, the one, the I, I think it was not. the other one said to me, um, were they all out of the 21 sashes? And so me being who I am, looked him in the eye and said, no, I think I look fucking great for 40. So why wouldn't I put it out there? Because I look a lot younger. And he had no improv. He was just like, oh, okay. okay. First, of all, first of all, the fact that you wanted this shirtless gentleman <laughs> whose only job was to get us interested in the show that he's not even in. He's not in it. Yeah. The fact that your goal was for him to have improv skills. Well, I guess just like what I realized in that moment was like, it was like he worked at a call center and he had memorized oh, a script. And then yes. when I went off the script, he was like, oh, I don't know. Yes. Yes. And what I like is the idea of them trying to like work their charms on us. And we were like, sir, grow up. I know. Because I guess for me also, like what I would suggest. Yeah. It was just noodling on a bit of a rewrite here. Is if you see a woman with a sash that says 40, don't say, were they all at a 21? Say, that's got to be a mistake. There's no way you're 40. Yeah. Charming. Complimentary. And then when the woman says, I think I look young for my age, don't just stare at her awkwardly. Agree. Yeah. Agree. Because I'm going to let you in on a little secret here, bro. Um, We're not actually getting impregnated by you picking us up with your hands. That's not how science or sex works. Yes. And uh, so maybe even if you think I look old, just live the fantasy. Play out the fantasy. Yeah, that was the problem. They aren't... Uh, uh, to, your, to your point, there just was no improv skill. Would it <laughs> hurt them to make them go through an improv class? You know what? This is what I can be doing to better the world. I don't typically teach improv, but I will I will absolutely put together a class for strippers, male strippers. Mm -hmm. Guess what, boys? I'm going to come to Vegas. I'm going to do a weekend intensive, sign up for the workshop. I'm going to help you get, get, you know, all cylinders mm -hmm. firing. And the second we see the guy who is like, she's, I can tell she's naughty because she's wearing a choker. We look at him and go, get out. Yeah. It's, you're too far. It's too far for you. You're, You're not welcome to get there. Too blue. Look, uh, I mean, was he typically handsome? Sure. Sure. One might say, no, that was being too nice. I was going to say one might say, maybe he could be like a Zac Efron stand-in. <laughs> it's not that nice. <laughs> but like, as long as they don't film anything. No, he was, he was cute. But my problem was, he looked, he looked 21. He and looked I was young. like, I, nope. Yep. Nope. Give me, how would I have reacted if that same gentleman was salt and pepper up there? That, well, well then he would have, and what salt, about this? Salt and pepper. It's, salt I'm and pepper. Already... Well, see, you're already out of your head. Yep. Well, what about this? Yeah. Salt and pepper. Oh, he doesn't yeah. bring up impregnating. What he said is, so when are we when are you gonna move into my house that has the wraparound porch? Uh, your text folder or mine. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, we gotta get into the case. This is again, you know, the, our <laughs> openers are getting longer and longer, and I couldn't be happier about it. Before you know it, the true crime is gonna come after the second break. <laughs> <laughs> What I love also is we haven't even gotten into the fact that I met Orlando Bloom last night. I mean, we haven't even gotten you into did. that. We haven't even gotten into it, but there's you no did. time. There's no time now. So oh. we'll have to get into it another time. Yeah. What I, Again, who do we who do we prioritize in this talk? The Vegas strippers. That's who. And that's really speaking yeah. to our true spirits. Our true, true spirits. Um, dear listeners, what a romp. Hmm. <laughs> Oh God, I'm all, I'm flustered. I'm flustered just thinking about that weekend. Best weekend of my life, by the way. Best weekend of my life, easily. We're talking video store murders here. So there is uh, obviously some background. There's a synopsis I can give you, as I always do on the show. Uh, and I'm really excited for this episode. Chrissy's been teasing to me a little bit about what this episode's going to be, and I'm very excited for it. That is really sweet of you to say it that way. Uh, <laughs> teasing you about it. Um... When in reality, ah, uh, this, this is a com. This the the efforts that went into to this to make this episode happen. I jumped through a lot more hoops than I planned. 
because on my on our last episode I said on the next true crime and cocktails and I I said I said some names um they're in this episode but <laughs> <laughs> as it happens you find a case that you're you you get really jazzed about and then it comes in and you're like oh shit there's not enough for an episode right so you got to you, you got to pivot. pivot pivot um and uh you just do your best and that's how uh we turned it into a uh, video store murders i love it well yeah. listen buckle in dear listeners let's get at it in november 1993 brian benson and sean campbell were found fat fatally stabbed at west coast video in pennsylvania and while video rental stores are a thing of the past, were they more dangerous than we realized? Christy worked at a video store for years, and Lord knows she'll prattle on about it in this episode. But on top of that, she will also deep dive the West Coast video case, as well as 13 other cases, all featuring victims attacked at video rental stores. Were the victims in the wrong place at the wrong time? Or were video stores a magnet for criminals? Christy Oxborough investigates. And I must remind wrote that some synopsis <laughs> yeah i would never say she's gonna prattle on is my point <laughs> yes please please know dear listeners um that was me that was fresh vegas me oh uh, yeah and uh, i think really and i know we've said this before specifically about our uh star trek cosplay yeah that there was like pre what pre riker and post riker yeah i think there was pre vegas and post vegas i get that because um yeah, I think I came home another person. Oh, I did. Uh, but something I, I find really hilarious is that was my second time in Vegas. My second time in Vegas, specifically with a friend of the show, Whitney. Yeah. My second time not saying goodbye to Whitney before I left. <laughs> the last morning was pure chaos. It was like everybody, it's yeah. just, we all know it's fine. Like, go. Yeah. yeah. It, it just made me laugh as we were driving, as like the car was heading to the airport. I was like, oh, shit. I haven't seen Whitney today. Ah, oh, it's two for two. <laughs> Feels right. So basically, the next time I'm in Vegas with Whitney, I have to purposely avoid her on the last day. <laughs> <laughs> you got to make it a trifecta. That's just how it works. So, oh, God. Well, disclaimer, which always feels like it comes in at such a weird time to go from like the joy that we were having um, uh, to darkness. But, but this is the this is the moment. You know what I mean? This is the yes. this is the transition. You're right. You're right. And that's one of the things you'll probably teach in your class is proper transitions. It's a part, big part of improv. Long form. Well, well. <laughs> three people that listen to this show just laughed. Three. <laughs> the people that know what in, long form improv is just laughed. Anyway. Oh, 100 percent. Anessa is cackling. Oh, yes. Friend of the podcast. Absolutely. Yeah. We're also at 38 minutes. This is <laughs> unprecedented. I the for the people that skip through the banter uh they're like how long is it this time anyway oh there's no chance that they didn't stop it at 20 and then skip it to 25 and then skip it to 30 and they're like how the fuck are they still going 35 come on <laughs> well great news almost if you if you get to 40 you've gone too far <laughs> <laughs> turn back barely <laughs> barely barely if i keep going like another if i, if I improv something for another minute Yep. Then they'll hit the sweet spot. Exactly. But I haven't taken that class yet, so I can't. So that's how you full circle it. So disclaimer, this episode will contain mentions of drug use and rape. So trigger warning for those who need it. So previously on True Crime and Cocktails, it's always my favorite part of shows when they- I love that. When someone gets to say previously all seductive like that. Yeah, that's my version of seductive. Um, I had said the next episode is Brian Benson and Sean Campbell. I was immediately fascinated by it. So I was like that. I'm absolutely doing that as an episode. And I kind of shoved it in there and then didn't think about it until I had to go research it. It turns out that there is not a lot of information about that specific case, especially not enough for a two hour episode like we normally do, unless we, to use my words, prattle on for an hour and a half. Uh, so I branched out further in my research, discovered so many true crime cases that involve video stores. So you were supposed to get one, but today you're getting 14. And that feels overwhelming, 
but some of them there is so little information they're gonna get like a paragraph and it's not because that's how i want it that's because some of them happen long enough the internet wasn't a thing and there's just not information about it out there so i have given what i can about each of these but the great news is this episode with exception to the last 40 minutes <coughs> is packed with true crime hey all kinds of true crime so there we go there we go but because this was the original idea i had for the episode i am of course going to start with brian benson and sean campbell who were born in april and january 1973 respectively on the morning of November 11th, 1993, the owner of West Coast Video in the Rosemore Shopping Center on County Line Road in Warminster, Pennsylvania, arrived at work. The front door was unlocked and slightly ajar. There was no sign of forced entry. In a back room that held the X-rated videos, the owner found the bodies of two employees, Brian Benson and Sean Campbell. Both men had been repeatedly stabbed in their backs, chests, and necks with some sort of long-bladed knife. According to their autopsies, each victim had defensive wounds on their forearms. Brian suffered deeper wounds than Sean, possibly because Brian was bigger of the two of them and therefore maybe was more of a threat to the assailants, or possibly because Brian was the main target. Although we don't know what the motive would have been if Brian was the main target. Brian and Sean were both just 20 at the time of their deaths. Both victims grew up in Warminster and had been friends most of their lives. Both were described as well-liked, while Sean was described as caring, protective, and loyal. Brian was described as loving, easygoing, and a good friend. Mm. Both victims went to the same high school and had mutual friends. They also both lived with their own parents within walking distance of West Coast Video. Oh. Sean worked full-time at Sylvan Pools and had been working part-time at the video store for six years. Brian went to Bucks County Community College and had been working at the store for six months. Police believe there may have been more than one assailant, as both victims were at least six feet tall and in good shape. From what the police could determine shortly before 10 p.m., while Brian and Sean were preparing to close, police believe the assailants either hid in the adult video room and ambushed the two victims, or the assailants somehow lured the victims to the back room before killing them there. Police looked into Brian and, and Sean's lives, hoping to find a potential suspect, but came up empty, so it's believed that neither victim was specifically targeted. Police interviewed more than 300 people, including the 75 who had rented movies that night during Brian and Sean's shift from 5 to 10 p.m. <clears throat> that also included Brian's father, Gary Benson, who stopped by the store around 9 p.m. He said nothing appeared to be out of the ordinary, so he rented his movies and he left. Gary's wife said that Gary has since been haunted by the fact that he didn't stay. Oh, God. And if that isn't heartbreaking enough, when Brian showed up at work, he learned he actually wasn't scheduled that night. No. But since he was there, the manager asked if he would just stay anyway. Oh, yeah. Police looked into whether the case was linked to a murder that occurred a week later at a New Jersey video store, but no connection could be found. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any details about that particular crime. Uh, an arrest was made in that case, and police determined the two cases were unrelated. Police found no murder weapon at the scene, but they did notice that the wire to the security camera, which was aimed at the cash register, had been cut. However, it would have done nothing even if they hadn't cut it. The camera was only set to record once the store was closed and the front door was locked. Mm. Police initially believed that the motive was robbery, as $300 cash was taken from the till. However, the suspects left some of the cash in the cash register, and they didn't bother to take either of the victim's wallets. A half-inch fake diamond stud earring was found on the floor between the two victims. It's believed that it was ripped from an assailant's ear during the struggle. A DNA sample was collected from blood and tissue on the earring, but no matches were found. Bucks County District Attorney Matt Weintraub claims the earring is not connected to the killers. 
but they never said the earring belonged to either of the victims. So I don't know how you can outright say it didn't belong to the killers. Yeah. Especially when it was found between the their bodies. A partially rusted knife was found behind the Rosemore Shopping Center in early 1997. It was tested but didn't yield any evidence. That same year, a jailhouse snitch named John Hall started calling Sean's family from prison, saying that a fellow inmate had confessed to the murders. Investigators determined that John was lying. And it turns out that John did this often, especially when it came to the high-profile cases in the area, which leads to a jailhouse sitch snide note. I said sitch and not snitch I meant to. I like a sitch snide note. Yeah. Yeah. Again, uh, you're getting you're getting post Vegas me and I hope you like it because this is just who she is now. I love it. So. 45 year old John Hall had a rap sheet stretching back more than 20 years. He was in and out of prison, sometimes only outside for a few hours before being arrested again. He was known for stealing cars and for his addiction to pills and alcohol. But John was also known as a full-on snitch who went by the name Monsignor. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. Yeah. Yeah. I also truly believe he chose that name himself. Yeah. As a snitch, John had a system. He would befriend a certain inmate, offer them legal advice, then contact someone on the outside to do some research into whatever crime that inmate was in prison for. Then John would use the information from the inmate and whatever he learned from the outside to create details that seemed only the suspect would know, and then he would present that information to his lawyer in the hopes he could exchange that for a reduced sentence of his own. By doing this, John led police to solving the cold case of four-year-old Barbara Jean Horn, whose body was found in a TV box in July 1988 in Philadelphia. Barbara was last seen around 3 p.m. before her body was discovered at 5.30 p.m., 1,000 feet or 305 meters from her home. Police arrested Walter Ogrod, uh, who had been living across the street from Barbara at the time of her murder. But Walter didn't match the description of the suspect in Barbara's case, and there were several inconsistencies between Walter's version of events and what actually happened. Police didn't search Walter's apartment at the time of the crime, and there was no physical evidence linking him to the crime. However, after a 14-hour interrogation, Walter signed a 16-page confession, which had been written by a detective. Ugh. The confession claimed that Walter lured Barbara to his basement by offering her chocolate, he then tried to sexually assault her, but she screamed, so he hit her in the head with an iron bar from a weightlifting set. After a mistrial in 1993, Walter was convicted in 1996 and sentenced to the death penalty. The key testimony came from John Hall. However, it was later determined that Walter was autistic and had been coerced into confessing. And when DNA that was found under Barbara's fingernails was later tested, it did not match Walter Ograd. In June 2020, Walter's conviction was overturned and he was released after serving 28 years oh. for a crime he didn't commit. God. And all because Monsignor decided he needed to lessen a sentence he was serving. Yep. Anyhow. Why did the uh, police continue to trust him? It's a bigger question. Never mind. Oh, there's, there's so many questions. I think they just so badly wanted a win. That they were like, let's, we yeah. got a bad guy. Let's, let's go for it. Uh, regarding the West Coast video case, a reward of over $60,000 was raised by the community to offer anyone who came forward with information that could lead to an arrest. In 2021, Brian and Sean's families donated the unused reward money to ver a variety of charities, including the Warminster Rotary Club the Warminster Food Bank, and the Hopes and Dreams Foundation, which helps disadvantaged youth. The Pennsylvania State Police allegedly offered to help with the case early on, but the local police turned them down. Allegedly. Mm -hmm. As of February 2023, that case remains unsolved. Wow. Yep. So, because I didn't have time uh, for great transitions, we're just going to go case number two love it 
Around noon on July 28, 1993, Miguel Victoria left his store, Victoria Video, on Union Avenue in Patterson, New Jersey, to run some errands. Miguel left his nephew, Tito Marino, in charge. Around 1.45 p.m., a customer went to the travel agency next door and asked if she could leave her rented tape with them as there was nobody inside the video store. When the owner, who was Miguel's sister, went to the video store, she found her nephew Tito lying face down in a pool of blood. He had been stabbed six times. Near the body was a purple and green plaid baseball cap. Police believe the motive was robbery as a VCR, various electronics, several car stereos, and $150 cash were all missing from the store. A customer told police they had dropped a video off at 1.30 and the store appeared to be empty. Then a few minutes later, a tall, clean-shaven African-American man walked out of the back room and told the customer to just leave the tape on the counter. The witness said the man didn't have a hat, but that he had blood on his shirt and blood dripping from his ear. Oh my Tito's, God! Tito's body was found less than an hour later. Tito Marino was just 22 years old at the time of his death. He was a college student who had recently emigrated from Peru. An anonymous caller contacted Patterson police to say she overheard three women at a laundromat claim that, quote, the guy from the video store had been killed while two black guys and a white guy were robbing him. Police were unable to find the women from the laundromat, but an another anonymous caller pointed police in the direction of suspects Ralph Lee and Eric Kelly, who both happened to be African-American and had both been seen in the area with their Caucasian friend, David Hancock. Two days after Tito's murder, police spoke with Ralph and Eric. Both claimed they were at a nearby church food pantry at the time of the murder. Neither man had scratches on their bodies, and police found no traces of blood on their clothing. But Eric signed a confession admitting to stabbing Tito. Ralph also signed one, saying that they had robbed the store and pawned the electronics for drug money. Eric and Ralph soon recanted their confessions, saying they had been pressured by the police to make them. Also, five years before the murder, Eric Kelly was in a car accident that left him with a traumatic brain injury that gives him difficulties processing information. Mm -hmm. And while the men may have confessed to the crime, they were unable to help recover the murder weapon or any of the missing electronics. Police checked pawn shops around. They couldn't find any pawn shop that had been given all of these things. So somehow they still felt these were the men. One witness claimed she had gone to the store to get a price on a refrigerator when she almost ran into a young African-American African man walking out of the store. When the witness left the store, she last saw the man, who wore a green hat, browsing videos. When shown a variety of mugshots, the woman couldn't identify the man. After Ralph and Eric were arrested, the woman was given a second, smaller group of photos, and she identified Ralph Lee as the man she had seen wearing the hat. According to their confessions... Eric Kelly was the one wearing the hat. After a trial in 1996, both Eric Kelly and Ralph Lee were convicted for the murder of Tito Marino. In 2007, the case was picked up by the Innocence Project. A DNA test was done on the hat, and Eric Kelly was ruled out as a contributor. In October 2014, a second, more sophisticated DNA test was run on the hat, which ruled out both Eric and Ralph as the hat's owner. It was also revealed that the DNA was run through the combined DNA index system known as CODIS, mm. and it found a match. A former Patterson, New Jersey resident named Eric Dixon, who has never been charged in connection with Tito Marino's murder. What? <laughs> yep. Not only did Dixon match the DNA of the hat found at the scene, he also matched the physical description of the person seen at the store at the time of the murder. According to records, Dixon served three years for robbing a store at Knife Point. The store, which was called Afro King, was located less than a mile from Victoria Video. Dixon entered the store, looking around, acting like a customer, before he put a knife to the throat of the female employee. Other customers tried to intervene, and Dixon left the scene. Dixon was released just three months before Tito's murder. Wow. He claims he had never been inside of Victoria Video 
and that he didn't recognize the hat despite it having his DNA all over it. After more than 10 years of litigation, Eric Kelly and Ralph Lee's convictions were overturned in April 2018, and both men were released after serving more than 24 years oh in prison. Oh, my God. Case number three. Around 9.30 a.m. on the morning of March 3rd, 1996, employees arrived at Hollywood Video in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where they discovered the bodies of three employees who had worked the night before. 18-year-old Jawanda Castillo, 19-year-old Zachary Blacklock, and 30-year-old Mylin Deody had all been shot in the back of the head three times. A day later, the body of Zachary's grandparents, 77-year-old George McDougall and 72-year-old Pauline McDougall, were found near their car uh, east of Albuquerque. The couple suffered multiple gunshot wounds. Thanks to an anonymous tip, police brought 28-year-old Shane Harrison and 41-year-old Esther Beckley in for questioning. Esther immediately confessed to everything even agreed to testify against Shane at a future trial. Esther claimed when they arrived at the store, they forced My, Ling, My Lin into the back office using a BB gun, which looked like a 45 caliber handgun. Esther asked My Lin to get the tape from the security camera. Zachary entered the office, followed by Shane and Jawanda. My Lin was taken to the front of the store to unlock the safe, just as George and Pauline arrived to pick up Zachary. Esther claims she went outside to distract them, claiming she was a friend of Zachary's and she got into the couple's vehicle because it was too cold for her to wait outside. Esther said that while she was in the vehicle, she heard gunshots from inside the store before Shane ran out with a plastic bag and a nine millimeter handgun. Shane allegedly got into the car, asked Esther to follow them in his car, and they drove to a wooded area outside of town where Shane shot George and Pauline with the shotgun. Oh, my God. Esther claims she pleaded with Shane to spare their lives. Okay. Due to the extensive news coverage, the trial was moved from Albuquerque to Las Cruces. Esther testified that she believed no one would get hurt during the robbery. Mm. Shane, of course, blamed Esther for the murders, saying Esther borrowed his leather jacket and his car that night, she returned the jacket with blood on it. But the prosecution claimed that it was Shane's fantasy to do an armed robbery and kill the witnesses. Wow. Yeah. The anonymous tip that led police to Esther and Shane also came up during the trial. Turns out that anonymous caller was Esther's boyfriend, John Lossell. John said Esther came to him hours after the murder and confessed to everything, including being a willing participant. Esther was adamant that she didn't pull the trigger that night, claiming she lied to John to impress him. But whether she pulled the trigger or not, John received $93,000 of a reward for turning in Esther and Shane. At the end of the trial, Shane was found guilty on over 20 counts, including first-degree murder, kidnapping, and armed robbery. He was sentenced to 258 years in prison. He is currently serving his sentence at the Southern New Mexico Correctional Facility in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Esther pleaded guilty to 10 charges, including armed robbery, kidnapping, and first-degree murder of George and Pauline. She was sentenced to 95 and a half years Esther is currently serving her sentence at the Western New Mexico Correctional Facility in Grants, New Mexico. Case number four. Cuatro. Oh, I like that. Again, improv. Around 8.15 p.m. on November 15th, 1998, a passerby noticed a woman crawling out of the movie store on the corner of Main Street and Fifth Avenue in Laurel, Montana. The woman had been stabbed multiple times in the neck and head, and her throat had been cut. The witness called 911, and the victim was rushed to St. Vincent Hospital in Billings, Montana, where she died a few hours later. The victim was Miranda Colleen Fenner, who was just 19 at the time. Police were unsure of a motive, but since a small amount of cash had been taken from the register, it was possible it was a robbery gone wrong. In 2000, a man in Glendive, Montana allegedly confessed to being involved in Miranda's murder, but the police said they had 
disproved the claims, which turned out to be mere rumors. That same year, the alleged suspect died during a police shootout. Miranda's case was discussed on Dateline, and in 2006, it was brought up on the Montel Williams show. Wow. During, during that particular episode, well-known psychic Sylvia Brown claimed that two men were responsible for Miranda's murder. But you have to take Sylvia's predictions with a grain of salt. In March 1999, Sylvia was asked what happened to Opal Joe Jennings, a six-year-old who had been abducted while playing in her grandparents' front yard in Saginaw, Texas. Sylvia said Opal had been taken to Japan and forced into some sort of slavery. Oh, God. But in January 2004, Opal's body was found buried in Fort Worth, Texas. Her abductor was convicted of kidnapping, but somehow not even charged with murder. Oh, wonderful. Yep. Then there was the time that Sylvia was asked about 11-year-old Sean Hornbeck, who disappeared while riding his bike to a friend's house in Richwoods, Missouri. Four months after his disappearance, his parents asked Sylvia if Sean was still alive. And Sylvia very bluntly said, no. More than four years later, Sean was found alive, living with his abductor in Kirkwood, Missouri, about 46 miles or 74 kilometers from where he was taken. Sean's abductor was later sentenced to life imprisonment. Yes. But that's not to say that Sylvia Brown was never accurate in her work. In a 2008 book, Sylvia said, quote, in around 2020, a severe pneumonia-like illness will spread throughout the globe, attacking the lungs and the bronchial tubes and resisting all known treatments. Almost more, than baff more baffling than the illness itself will be the fact that it will suddenly vanish as quickly as it arrived, attack again 10 years later, and then disappear completely. Sylvia also predicted that two people would be arrested for the Oklahoma City bombings, that Arnold Schwarzenegger would run for political office, and that the Jean Benet Ramsey case would never be solved. But again, take Sylvia's predictions with a grain of salt. Yes. Sylvia Brown passed away in 2013 at the age of 77. And if you think I'm not terrified of the year 2030 now. I can't even think about that. Yep. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> if we're going down, we're going down in Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Oh, God. This is, again, again, if you miss the beginning bit, how do you pick up on these bits? I don't know. Are they just extra annoying and you boop, boop, boop? I can't think about it. Who's don't listening to that int intensively is the other thing where it's like, and I now I go ahead and now I go ahead. You know what <laughs> I mean? I don't know. I can't think about it. And I hope they don't tell us. I don't want to know if you don't. skip. Don't. I don't want to know if you're a passionate skipper. It's fine. I'm you a passionate can. lover. <laughs> Uh, ahoy, Captain. <laughs> I don't even know. Completely lost our minds. Oh, we have. We have. But congratulations. This is who we are now. Yep. Just broken, broken creeps. Couple of creeps. Couple of creeps. Ah, uh, so regarding Miranda Fenner. Yes. Despite her case receiving widespread media attention, it soon went cold and police had no suspects for nearly two decades. In April 2016, while in a psychiatric hospital in Spokane, Washington, a man named Zachary O'Neill confessed to Miranda's murder. But according to the police, O'Neill didn't offer any information that hadn't already been released publicly, so they told him to leave. Not interested. A year later, O'Neill was arrested for burglary and a firearms charge. While in custody, detectives matched O'Neill's DNA to a rape case from 1998, so he was extradited to Montana to face charges. In Montana, O'Neill confessed to the rape and attempted murder of a newspaper carrier in September 1998. O'Neill admitted that he tried to kill the woman to avoid being caught for the rape. O'Neill also confessed to another rape, also from September 1998, and while his DNA matched that sample that was found at the scene, he was not charged for it, as the victim had died in 2013. And like he had a year before, O'Neill also confessed to the murder of Miranda Fenner a second time. And not only was it his second time confessing to that crime, but he had been questioned by police about that crime back in 2000. 
Turns out the night of Miranda's murder, O'Neill had rented four movies under his stepfather's account from the movie store. But when questioned back then, he denied any involvement in the crime. But in 2017, O'Neill finally admitted to the crime and offered police details that had not been previously released. O'Neill said that when he arrived home with the four movies, his mother noticed one of the films was pornographic. And since O'Neill was just 18 at the time, his mother made him return it. O'Neill said he returned to the store with the plans to rob it as he had a history of theft to support his drug addiction. Oh, I got another theory. I got a psychologist oh. hat on about that. But anyway, oh, continue. When he found the store filled with customers, he waited until the place was empty, then pulled out a gun and demanded money, which Miranda gave willingly. O'Neill said that he then forced Miranda into a back room where he tried to cut her throat, but the knife was too dull, so he stabbed <sighs> her multiple times. He also claimed he was high on meth at the time. Zachary O'Neill was sentenced to life imprisonment. Wowzer. Um, my God, this is a, yeah, you, you know, you, this is chock full of true crime. This episode so much, and which I almost not... makes up for 40 minutes of rattling. There's no, there's no making up for it. We're gifts to the world. You said it to the man on the plane and it's just the truth. We no, we're very we're good, good at what, what we, we do. do. We're yeah. good at what we do. Yeah. Um, and on that note, let's hit let's hit the can. Take a break. Grab a drink. Drain the hog. And uh, we'll be right back with more on this video store murders episode of True Crime and Cocktails. All right. Clap two. Electric boogaloo. One, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're, of course, discussing video store murders. A uh, culm culmination? That's not the word I want. The culmination of my work? It's the culmination of your work, but there's another C word I think I'm looking for. Compilation? No. No. This isn't uh, our greatest hits. <laughs> well, it could be. Uh, but I was <laughs> going to say another one of Christie's curated episodes. There it curated. is. It finally, it's just that it, the brain is still a little slow. We're still on Vegas time. Um, but listen, okay. Uh, you, you left us in what state? You left us in Montana. Where are we yeah. going now? Well, I told you off the top or 40 some minutes in uh, that I had 14 cases That's right. for you. And for those playing along at home, that means we have 10 remaining. Hello. Again, for those who are like, how long is this episode going to be? 10 more cases? Again, some very, very little information about them. But we are heading to Washington. Fantastic. That was the other thing I loved about this is we span not only times, but places. You yeah. kind of go all over the place. Uh, so when customers entered Liberty Video in Wenatchee, Wenatchee? Oh, boy, I bet I said that wrong. Uh, Washington, on December 19th, 2001, they discovered that the clerk had been shot. 22-year-old Christina Marie Clement, known as Chrissy, was bleeding from a gunshot wound to the head. She was taken to Central Washington Hospital, where she died from her injuries. Chrissy was a married mother of one who enjoyed ceramics and fishing. She also was the sole financial supporter for her parents. Oh. Police assumed that the motive was a robbery, as there were no bills left in the store's cash register. Police found a person of interest who was seen around the store at the time of the murder, and three days after Chrissy's murder, a SWAT team stormed the apartment of 33-year-old Michael Raymond Garrett. The thing about Garrett was he had just been released from prison on December 14th, just five days before Chrissy's murder. The same day he was released, Garrett burglarized two houses in Wenatchee, then four days later, he went on a cocaine binge before robbing and stabbing a man. Oh boy. On December 19th, Garrett continued his crime spree by burglarizing the office of the pr prosecuting attorney for Shalon, Shalon County, and then stealing a gun and ammunition. Later that day, Garrett went to Liberty Video, where he shot Chrissy Clement and emptied the cash register. And the worst part of all of this crime spree is that Garrett was prematurely released from prison due to a computer coding error. 
Oh my God. People died. Between 2001 and 2015, an estimated 3,200 offenders were released prematurely due to a computer glitch, which wasn't discovered until 2012. Oh my, that is a horror show. Yep. Corrections officials say that a software fix would have prevented so many prisoners from being wrongfully released. However, that fix was somehow delayed 16 times. An official said, quote, failure to fix this software error when it was first identified in 2012 was a management error. It wasn't a problem with how to fix it. It was a matter of misprioritizing it, not allocating the budget resources to it and not making sure it got done. Because of the mix up, Garrett was transferred on October 2nd from Walla Walla State Prison. By the way, Walla Walla is very fun to say. I recommend it. Uh, he was transferred to a pre-release facility and given a release date of December 14th. But by the end of October, he was sent back to Walla Walla for rules infractions. He lost 70 days of accumulated good time and his release date got pushed to February of 2002. But in November, Garrett appealed the loss of these accumulated good time days. So his release date was then reinstated to December 14th. Also, the address that Garrett gave as his post-release residence, he had no permission to live there. Oh. He just gave an address, and no one checked into that. Okay. Wow. Due to the computer mix-up, Chrissy's husband filed a wrongful death suit against the state of Washington and was awarded $1.2 million. Good. Another ex-con, 45-year-old Robert Jackson, was wrongfully released in 2015 while serving time for a robbery. Two months after his release, Jackson got into an accident while driving intoxicated and killed his girlfriend, 35-year-old Lindsay Hill. Jackson was supposed to serve a life sentence as that was his third serious felony conviction and the state of Washington has a three strikes law where people who are convicted of three violent offenses automatically face a life sentence. In 2021, state legislators removed second degree robbery from the list of offenses that are considered a strike. So Jackson's sentence was reduced to 33 years. And Garrett, who was serving five life sentences plus 41 years for murder and robbery, was resentenced in April 2022 to one life sentence plus 34 and a half years. Yeah. I don't get it. No, 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 me neither. But the best we can do is just keep trucking on. Yeah. Now, these next three cases, I have grouped them together because they all occurred at adult video stores. Got it. On the night of April 18th, 1974, 24-year-old Patricia Carol Webb disappeared from the adult book and cinema store in Lincoln, Nebraska. Along with Patricia, a calculator, $30 cash, and 51 bondage-themed adult magazines were also missing. The front door to the store was unlocked, and a cord leading to a payphone had been cut. Two days later, Patricia's body was found under a bale of hay on a farm east of Hallam, which is about 26 miles or 41 kilometers south of Lincoln. There was a piece of tape over her mouth, and her naked body was wrapped in a quilted jacket, which was one of only 143 of those jackets that existed. Jackets had been given out by a nearby feed mill, to customers and employees. Patricia had been shot six times, twice in the head and four times in the body with t with a 22 caliber and a 25 caliber gun, guns, I guess. Police believed the 22 caliber was a rifle and the 25 caliber was a handgun. Aside from the bullet wounds, Patricia's body wasn't harmed in any way. And while she was found naked, there were no signs of any sexual assault. It is believed that Patricia was killed elsewhere and taken to that area as there was little but blood found nearby. Patricia's purse was found in a ditch about a mile and a half from her body, but her clothes were never found. Oh, boy. Patricia's mother died when Patricia was just four years old, so her uncle Robert and his wife Joan adopted her. She loved to roller skate and was described as popular and beautiful. 
1967, Patricia was named Miss Nebraska at the North Central Regional Amateur Roller Skating Championships in Kansas City. Patricia later won a silver at the National Championship in Lincoln. And I said Kansas City. I have to shout out Kansas City, who recently won the Super Bowl. I didn't watch, but it made Paul Rudd really happy, and that makes me very happy because I love to see that joyful man receive joy. So, and also, Rihanna fucking knocked it out. Yes. Making that performance a baby reveal. I've been, like, walking around, like stank stomping with my hand flapping behind my back for days <laughs> like i do it when like no one else is around and i'm like walking down the hall to the bathroom unless it's an emergency <laughs> <Christ. laughs> this post vegas huh this is it baby <laughs> this is it i want to say it's gonna get better from here but how can it it ain't we're really good at what we do. So anyhow, <laughs> it was just how blunt I was about it that I was like, well, sir, I'm glad you asked what I did. I shouldn't be embarrassed. We're good at it. Uh, I mean, I love the confidence, but I, yeah, that I also love that this next episode, we are more unhinged than ever before. It makes I sense. Know, so I, I pray that this isn't where she starts. I mean, I don't actually anticipate her listening to any of it, but it was still. So. Patricia graduated from Southeast High School in 1968, and a few months later, she got married. The marriage didn't last long, and the couple soon divorced, but then she enrolled at the University of Nebraska before eventually dropping out. The investigation into her death was a joint effort of the Lincoln Police, the Nebraska State Patrol, the Lancaster County Sheriff's Office, and the FBI. In the first year, investigators logged nearly 15,000 man hours on the case. They consulted clairvoyance and investigated motorcycle gangs and satanic cults, but in the end, no arrests were made. Witnesses came forward claiming to have seen a young woman leave the store around 1 a.m. with an African-American man. The couple then got into a large older car that looked like a Cadillac or a Buick. Police found a man matching the description along with a, an, a potential accomplice, but they found no evidence connecting the men to Patricia's murder. So is it that Patricia's ex-husband was involved? Did their marriage end amicably? Was he angry for more than five years? Because that was the time frame between the divorce and her death. Was it just a robbery gone wrong? If it was, why wouldn't the killers have just shot Patricia at the store and left her body at the scene? Why did they take extra care to hide the body? Why was her body naked? There was no sign of sexual assault. So to me, being naked feels like an attempt to humiliate the victim and feels incredibly personal. Or did Patricia's murder have something to do with the fact that Patricia was an undercover informant for the Lancaster County Attorney's Office? Whoa, didn't see that coming. Patricia did some undercover work in late 1973 and early 1974, helping to set up drug buys that led to the arrest and conviction of more than two dozen people. Patricia had allegedly stopped working as an informant in early, two, in, in early 1974, but had started up again shortly before her death as she owed about $4,000 to finance companies. And it turns out Patricia went missing the night before she was supposed to testify in court. Lancaster County attorney Robert Gibson said half a dozen drug cases had to be dismissed when Patricia failed to show up in court that day. Most of the cases were for small amounts of amphetamines and marijuana, so is it possible those smaller cases were meant to lead to a bigger fish who took out the only witness that could hurt his business? Whether a local drug kingpin was investigated or not, as of February 2023, Patricia's case remains unsolved. Which brings us to case number seven. To, I mean, to explain it, there was an adult bookstore, an adult video store, and a family world amusement video store all in one building in Wahiwu, Hawaii. Now, on December 16th, 1985, employees of the Family World portion noted that the door to the adult video area was locked, which was unusual for that time of day. So at 1.50 p.m., the employees kicked down the door 
and in a rear office, they discovered the bodies of 56-year-old Carol Drake, who co-owned the business, and 39-year-old Terry Shimizu, also known as Terry Fox, who was the video store's manager. According to the medical examiner, Carol had been stabbed in the back and died from a knife wound to the heart. Terry's throat was cut, but she died from a stab wound to the neck. Both women were fully clothed, and there was no sign of sexual assault. Police believe robbery may have been a motive, as the cash receipts for the day were missing, and there was an envelope full of money lying on the floor. Police also suggested it may have been a former, former disgruntled employee. And maybe it was a disgruntled customer. After all, in the 1980s, pornography was seen as a violation of community standards. April 1984, Carol was charged with selling a sexually explicit magazine to an undercover officer. She was found guilty, and on December 2nd, just two weeks before her murder, Carol was sentenced to one year's probation. And in June 1985, Terry was arrested and charged with promoting pornography. Her case was pending at the time of her death. And in 1988, Deborah Cohen, who worked at the Wahiwa Adult Bookstore after Terry and Carol, was arrested for selling an adult magazine to an undercover police officer. So it was just, I mean, it was the time, I guess. Yeah. So, I mean, the list of potential suspects just feels very large if that was the issue. Yeah. As of February 2023, Carol and Terry's murders remain unsolved. But one last thing about the Wahiwu adult video store before I move on. Just six months before Terry and Carol's murders, another employee was murdered. What? Which leads me to a serial killer side note. Oh, boy. 25-year-old Vicki Gail Purdy went to go clubbing in Waikiki on May 29, 1985. She was last seen by the taxi driver who dropped Vicki off at the Shorebird Hotel around midnight. Vicki had told him she was picking up her car, which was found in the hotel parking lot the following day. The next morning, Vicki's body was found near the Keahi Lagoon. Her hands were bound behind her back. She had been raped and strangled. Due to the sexual nature of Vicky's murder, police believed it might have been linked to her job at the Wahiwu adult video store. But then on January 14th, 1986, 17-year-old Regina Sakamoto went missing on her way to a bus stop in Waipahu. Waipahu, there we go. She was last heard from at 7.15 a.m., the next day, Regina's body was found at the Keahi Lagoon, her hands bound behind her back, her body naked from the waist down, and like Vicky, she had been raped and strangled. Two weeks later, January 30th, 21-year-old Denise Hughes failed to show up at the phone company where she worked as a secretary. Two days later, Denise's body was found by three men in a drainage canal. Her body was wrapped in a blue tarp, and her hounds, hands were bound again raped and strangled then february 5th police established a serial killer task force to try and track down the man who had come to be known as the honolulu strangler wow the task force involved 27 officers including members of the fbi on march 26 25 year old louise maderos went missing from the airport after returning from a trip to oahu her body was found by road workers on April 2nd near the Waiki, Waikile stream. She was naked from the waist down, hands bound behind her back. She had been strangled, and just like the three women before her, but in this case, Louise was three months pregnant. Mm. On April 29th, 36-year-old Linda Pichet left work around 7 p.m. 30 minutes later, her car was found parked beside the Nimitz H1 viaduct, Linda's roommate reported her missing the following day. A 43-year-old man named Howard Andrew Gay went to the police and told them a psychic told him that Linda's body was at Sand Island. On May 3rd, Howard went with the police to the island, but there was nothing in the location that Howard claimed the body would be. But then police noticed that Howard seemed to be avoiding a specific part of the island, and when they searched that part... They found Linda's body. 
Mm. She was naked and again, hands bound behind her back. Right. Six days later, police arrested Howard as their primary suspect. Howard's ex-wife and girlfriend both said that Howard had a bondage fetish and he would often have sex with them when their hands were bound behind their backs. Ooh. Howard's girlfriend admitted that whenever they fought, Howard would leave the house for hours. And those nights coincided with the dates the five women went missing. Howard was interrogated for seven hours, which included him failing a polygraph test. But with no evidence, Howard was eventually released. A $25,000 reward was offered by a private business. And two months later, a woman came forward to say she saw Linda Pichet with a man on the night of the murder. The witness picked the man out of a photo lineup, but then she got scared that the man might have seen her, so she retracted her statement and refused to testify. The reward went unclaimed, and no other murders have since been linked to that case. Howard Gay moved to California and died in 2003 at the age of 60. He was never officially charged with any of the murders. The Honolulu Strangler was never caught. He was the second known serial killer to be active in Hawaii, the first being Eugene Barrett, who married three women. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Not married. Well, he did. Anyhow, he murdered three women. There we go. Between 1959 and 1995. The first was Annie E. Phillips, a divorced mother of five, who he briefly dated in 1959. Due to Barrett's excessive drinking and his lack of a job, Annie broke up with him, and Barrett responded by shooting Annie multiple times in front of her youngest child. Oh, God. With more of her children just in the next room. Barrett was arrested and sentenced to life imprisonment, which he which was later reduced to 15 to 50 years. He was paroled in 1967. When he returned to Honolulu, he married Roberta Eula... Yululani Avero in January 1971, but they divorced in November 1972. A month later, Barrett went to the Hawaii hotel where Roberta was staying and stabbed her multiple times with a kitchen knife. After his arrest, Barrett pleaded guilty and waived his right to a trial. He was convicted of manslaughter. Yep, love how that works. Sentenced to 10 years. He was paroled. In 1976. God damn it. I don't know if you needed to know that. Again, he murdered her in 1972 and got 10 years and was released four years later. Uh -huh. Just making sure we all knew that math. Uh, his parole requirements were dismissed five years after he was paroled. Why? I don't know. Jesus. Uh, he's proven to be a repeat offender. At some point, Barrett became enamored with his neighbor across the hall, 41-year-old Denisha Kastner. There is no evidence that they were a couple or had some sort of intimate relationship, but Barrett often told people he was afraid he might hurt Denisha. Friends convinced Barrett to seek psychiatric treatment, and he voluntarily admitted himself at the Queens Medical Center, where he stayed until August 1995. When Barrett was released, he discovered Denisha had moved to the apartment building across the street. And that made him angry because he was convinced Denisha would next move out of the neighborhood entirely. So on August 11th, Barrett went to get beer. And when he saw Denisha entering her apartment, he went back to his apartment, grabbed a 25 caliber pistol and shot Denisha twice in the head. Denisha was taken to a hospital where she died from her injuries a few hours later. Police found the murder weapon behind the apartment complex. It had been reported stolen back in 1989. Barrett surrendered himself and was charged with theft, unlawful possession of a firearm, and murder. He was found guilty on all counts and sentenced to life imprisonment. The judge added that Barrett would, Barrett would be required to serve at least 40 years before he was eligible for parole. Why? Why? This is the third murder! Yep. I can't. Yep. Barrett spent most of his time incarcerated in Oklahoma before being transferred to a prison in Hawaii. He died in prison in November 2003 from an undisclosed illness. He was 72 at right. the time. Yeah. So, case number eight. And get this. It's from our home country of Canada. Hello. Around 11.30 a.m. on January 27th, 1998, 
two friends found the body of 23-year-old Renee Sweeney behind the counter at Adults Only Video in Sudbury, Ontario, Canada. She had been repeatedly stabbed. Renee studied music at Laurentian University and dreamed of becoming a teacher. She was described as cheerful, well-liked, with a smile that brightened everyone's day. When the friends entered the store, a man ran past them out the door. He was seen running further down the street by another witness. The store was in a strip mall on Paris Street, which is one of the busiest streets in Sudbury. Shortly after the murder, police announced that 31-year-old John Fetterly was a suspect. Days later, Fetterly was released and the charges against him were dropped. Police released two posters, one featuring a pair of black and white Brooks running shoes and a turquoise color high Sierra jacket. Uh, the jacket was found with a safety pin in the left inner pocket for some reason. The second poster featured a sketch of the suspect who just was described as a Caucasian male between 5'10 and 6 feet tall, thin, early 20s, clean shaven with short dark hair and glasses. Police requested voluntary blood samples from hundreds of men in the hopes of ruling them out in the investigation that feels legally dicey. But uh, I don't know how many agreed to give samples, but no arrests were made and police were left without any leads. In 2017, the Greater Sudbury Police released a new composite sketch of the suspect created using snapshot DNA phenotyping technology, which tries to predict appearance and ancestry from DNA samples. Then a year later, police announced they had identified a person of interest in the case and that they had gathered forensic evidence that led them to believe they had the right man. So on December 11, 2018, 39-year-old Robert Stephen Wright was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. Police did not provide details as to how they were pointed in Wright's direction. At the time of Renee's murder, Robert was an 18-year-old high school student. Uh, at the time of his arrest, he was living in North Bay, Ontario, working at the North Bay Regional Hospital as a lab tech. In August 2019, the charges were decreased to second-degree murder, meaning the murder was not planned. Wright was denied bail in 2019, 2020, and 2022. In July 2020, Wright's lawyers applied to get the change of venue, and at some point, Wright contracted COVID-19. So he's been there without a trial, and it's just kind of been ongoing for years, but it was little things. I think at one point, a lawyer uh, had to recuse themselves from the case. It's just a lot of things that kept pushing oh, wow. back. Uh, but after years of delay, Wright's trial is set to begin this month, which, if you're listening in the future, is February 2023. Wow. And it's set to last about five weeks. If it convicted, Wright will receive an automatic life sentence. Yeah. So assuming that it gets talked about in the news in some way, that'll be an update. There will be point, updates. I'm sure. Now. We have talked about cases in six different video stores, and there have been so many video stores over the years. Rogers Video, Jumbo Video, Civic, Hollywood Video, Choices UK, Showtime Video, Bridgeport Video, or Video Easy, to name a few. But the remaining cases in today's episode all took place in a blockbuster. Ah, the first blockbuster opened October 19, 1985 in Dallas, Texas, and at the height of the chain's popularity in 2004, there were more than 9,000 locations worldwide. But as we know, by now, the chain is all but gone. In 2002, the blockbuster was valued at $5 billion. That dropped to $300 million in 2011 before it was basically shut down in 2014. There is, however, one blockbuster location that exists to this day in Bend, Oregon. It originally opened in 1992, and as of 2019, it officially became the last of the chain to remain open. And there's still a, is. There's a great documentary, actually, about that. I believe That's it's nice. called the, the Last Blockbuster. It's it's a fun watch. And I, it's the right time for it because people are nostalgic. Yeah. And I hear they do, like, Airbnb like movie sleepovers. Yeah. I mean, I'm charmed. I'm charmed by it. It's cute. So getting into blockbuster cases. 
First, we're heading to White Rock, Texas. On April 4th, 1994, 18-year-old Leon Dorsey robbed a blockbuster at gunpoint. After getting $392 from the cash register, Dorsey demanded that the employees, 26-year-old James Armstrong and 20-year-old Brad Lindsay, open the safe in the back room. But when neither men could open the safe, Dorsey fatally shot them both. The entire incident was captured on security cameras. Prior to the incident, Dorsey had no criminal record. But between this crime and when he was caught, he was charged with shooting a 51-year-old woman at a grocery store and also charged with unauthorized use of a motor vehicle. Dorsey received a 60-year sentence for the crime before being convicted of the blockbuster murders. Dorsey was sentenced to the death penalty and executed for his crime in 2009. Wow. Case 10. Again, see, some of them, super short. In late 1999, there was a string of robberies and sexual assaults at Blockbuster stores in central Tennessee. On December 6th, a Springfield officer noticed unusual activity inside a store. A woman in the store was waving for the officer to enter the building. When he did, he found two women who said that a masked man had entered the store and forced them into the back room at gunpoint. One of the women was ordered to undress as the suspect attempted to sexually assault her. The police officer arrived just in time to stop the, the assault, and the suspect quickly fled the scene. However, the suspect, 19-year-old Matthew Jackson, was arrested in October 2000. He was charged with multiple counts of aggravated robbery and rape, as well as charges for similar rapes and robberies throughout Tennessee. As part of a plea agreement, Jackson pleaded guilty to four counts of aggravated robbery and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. And I just want to say, no, no, no counts of rape. Ten years feels short for that. It does. It absolutely crime. does. String of crimes. Yeah, it does. I agree. Um, then we have on September nineteenth, two thousand one, twenty nine year old Michael McGrath entered a blockbuster on Grant Road in Mountain View, California, where he killed thirty three year old Carl Mary Catani better known as Chip. According to the security camera footage, McGrath stabbed Chip and then left the store with a handful of cash. McGrath's legal team claimed he hadn't intended to rob the store. He was just high on meth at the time. Mm. He was sentenced to life in prison. Case 12. At 7.35 p.m. on December 30th, 2001, Anthony Dent and Malcolm Rogers, both members of the Rolling 40 Crips, went to the Blockbuster on 54th and Western in Los Angeles, California. Rogers went into the store, grabbed a video, and stood in line. Dent entered the store, drew his gun, and ordered the 30 to 40 customers and multiple employees to lay on the ground. He then ordered a clerk to open two cash registers and a safe. Rogers took the money and left, noticing that Dent somehow had left before him. When Rogers left the store, he found Dent in the parking lot, pointing his gun at 31-year-old Joseph Ray Paul. Dent told Joseph to lay down, then shot him in the back of the head as Joseph was trying to comply. Dent and Rogers got to their car and a third accomplice drove off. Joseph was taken to King Drew Medical Center, where he died a few days later. Dent and Rogers fled the scene on foot. Joseph's sister... Farrell Robbins was the LAPD chaplain who helped families in time of grief and loss. Ugh. And Joseph himself had recently passed the written exam to become a Beverly Hills police officer. He was also a father of two children under the age of five. Mm. Dent was arrested February 8th, 2002, while Rogers was already in custody for other charges at the time of Dent's arrest. But at the time of his arrest, Dent was wanted for two other murders that occurred after the blockbuster robbery. On the afternoon of January 10th, 2002, Dent fatally shot 41-year-old Ricardo Frazier in broad daylight. Then on January 27th, Dent shot and killed 49-year-old Vincent Williams over some sort of drug debt. Dent pleaded not guilty to Joseph's murder, but was convicted of two counts of first-degree murder and one count of robbery, he was sentenced to two consecutive life terms without the possibility of parole 
plus three terms of 25 years to life for various firearm charges. Case 13 for you, around 6.30 p.m. on May 15, 2002, a man entered a blockbuster in Anniston, Alabama, took $100 and forced two employees into the back room where they were fatally shot. The man then went back and shot two customers. The victims were identified as 22-year-old Austin Carl Joplin, 27-year-old Douglas Edward Neal, 21-year-old Joseph Michael Birch, and his brother, 19-year-old Andrew Robert Birch. Three of the four victims were shot in the back of the head. A witness saw a man leave the store shortly after the murders. The store also had a security camera, but it wasn't working at the time. However, the murder weapon was left at the scene, which led police to 48-year-old Donald Ray Wheat, who matched the description given by the witness. Police also found blood on Wheat's blue jeans that matched the youngest victim, Andrew Birch. Five days before the murders, Wheat murdered Travis Richardson, the owner of a convenience store in Bowdoin, Georgia. Wheat claimed that, the that at the blockbuster, he only killed Andrew Birch and that his girlfriend, Tina Marie Duke, killed the other three victims. Duke claimed she accompanied Wheat to multiple robberies simply because she was scared of him and was scared to not do what he asked. The other robberies include one at a movie gallery in Heflin, which is about 20 miles or 32 kilometers east of Anison. The clerk there was stabbed 10 times, but thankfully survived. Duke was arrested in May 2002 for two of the alleged robberies, not including the blockbuster in Anniston. I don't know what happened to her after that, but Wheat was convicted of the crime and sentenced to the death penalty. Wheat had a history of violence. In 1971, he was convicted of manslaughter for stabbing his cousin, 20-year-old Larry Holcomb. He spent 10 years in jail for the crime and was sentenced to two more years for committing a burglary in Talladega. In 1973, Wheat escaped from jail and was sentenced to an additional, an additional year after being caught. He was paroled in 1975. I don't understand how you escape, get extra years, and then get out early anyway. Yeah. Uh, but again, far cry uh, from the 10 years he was supposed to be sentenced to. Wheat's family said he tried to get his life on track after uh, he killed his cousin. But he suffered injuries in 1988 while working as a farmhand, and the pain from that and the numerous surgeries he had to have because of it caused him to become addicted to drugs, and that's what eventually led to uh, the life he lived, I suppose. Mm. We died in prison in May 2004 from massive internal bleeding caused by liver disease and severe ulcers. Which leads us to the final case of the day, case number 14. <coughs> I presented this cases mostly in chronological order, but I saved this one for last because it was unlike any of the others. In August 1996, 27-year-old Kenrick Hines was arrested and charged with armed robbery, robbery conspiracy, and a weapon violation after robbing a blockbuster in Rockville, Maryland on June 13th. Hines and his accomplice, 24-year-old Douglas Faconye, something like that, uh, entered the store wearing masks and forced the two employees into the back room where they found the victim's arms and legs. The suspect took nearly $10,000 in cash and merchandise. Police said the crime was very similar to a dozen other robberies that had occurred in the area, including a blockbuster robbery in Bethesda on May 20th and another in Arlington on August 1st. Witnesses from the Arlington robbery gave police a description of the getaway vehicle, which led police to Douglas. The vehicle was searched and police found a knife, binoculars, a pellet gun, ski masks, and disposable plastic handcuffs. When questioned, Douglas not only admitted to the robberies, but he also told the police about Kendrick Hines. Kendrick Hines. There we go. The thing about Hines is that he owned a video store called Video 18 which he opened in the fall of 1995. And when police searched the store, they found tens of thousands of dollars worth of video games, movies, computers, shelving, and other property that he had stolen from other video stores, <laughs> including 
multiple blockbuster locations, as well as a Hollywood video and a Rockies video. Police determined Hines was involved to, in 10 to 14 armed robberies dating back to July 1995, just before opening his own location. But why would he target Blockbuster? Probably because he used to work there, and it seems he was really bitter about getting fired. Oh, boy. Unfortunately, I could not find out what happened to Hines or his accomplice, but with the evidence police found, I have to believe he did some jail time. I can honestly say while looking for crimes committed in video rental stores, I didn't expect to find out a suspect robbing a place to specifically stock up his own place. Was uh, That was a new one. Uh, and while video rental seems to be a thing of the past, there are still some locations open to this day. I mean, the Bend, Oregon Blockbuster. And also there is a movie mart that is still fully operational in Kamloops, BC, Canada. That store was robbed twice in the span of eight days in January 2019. Both times the suspect entered the store wearing a mask, jumped the counter, and forced the employee to open the register at knife point. Once the perp got the money, they fled the store and went west down St. Paul Street. And the surprising part is both robberies happened in broad daylight, and the suspect or suspects remain at large. And just like that, I somehow managed to squeeze even more true crime into this already jam-packed episode. How does she do it? Maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's neuroses. <laughs> Reporting for True Crime and Cocktails. <laughs> I'm Christy Oxborough. You're very good at what you do. <laughs> so I told a man on a plane. Absolutely. Listen, yeah. let's take one more break, hit the can, grab another drink, and then we're going to be back with our final thoughts on this slew of video store murders on this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. All right, on three. One, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're, of course, discussing video store murders. And to your point in your synopsis, man, oh, man, real hot spot. I guess for me, it's like you hear about gas station robberies. So then there's yes. obviously going to be some murders that go along with that. But yeah, video stores. Wow. I guess I just would never think of video stores having that much cash on hand. But I guess, again, this was in a different time and there would be more cash sure. than maybe some other places. I don't know. Oh, I... Um, I never considered it yeah and i and i worked in one for like five years and i looking back it wasn't safe like it just straight up wasn't yeah like there was a time this i mean what's she gonna do fire me now no there was a time that uh we we worked in a store that had a an adult store like an adult section in a room in the back and we had cameras in, and sometimes you got to keep an eye on what's going on in there. Nice. And then you you got to like rock, paper, scissors uh, as to who's going to have to go give a little knock on the door sometimes if someone oh, was starting or whatever. People great, are animals. They Oh, God, they are. Oh, my God. <laughs> the amount of times that was employees, I can't. That's, come yeah. on. Oh, there was a girl who was infamous for like, do you want to come make out in the porn room at the store? And I was like, but neither here nor there. Go I, home. Go to I, your home. Oh, I think she was like 18 and home would have meant parents. And But still, I'm like, I, I, I don't know. Bless. I hope she's, uh, I hope she's doing well. But there, there was a particular night that someone had come in the store and we didn't even like, he was so quiet. Like he just made a beeline right for that room. So we didn't even think about it. It was almost time for closing. We're just like, we're ready to go. And we're like closing things down, counting tills, whatever, shutting everything down, lights out. And then we hear like a, a a doorknob. And we were like, what's that? He came out of the room with a video to rent. And we were like, oh my God, sir. We've actually shut down. We did not know you were in the store. Um, So sorry, but like you could totally come back tomorrow. It's been... Oh, 25 years easy since that happened. But I could go with a police sketch artist and we could have an exact <laughs> picture of that man's face because it's still there. It's still in my brain. He was a regular customer. Um, but 
I've never been more horrified in my life. Yeah, that's disgusting. When I was like, oh, God, sir, I am so sorry. But we couldn't tell our boss because we didn't want to be like, we didn't check the room before we of course, just started. So I was like, ah, uh, we just, I mean, we said we'd take it to our graves, but I didn't know a podcast would become a thing. And here you are. And here, here I are. am. Here I and am, to be clear, but... I'm not saying it's disgusting that he's renting porn. What I'm saying was no. disgusting was that it was like, what was he doing in that room in public? Stop it. He was um, in there for a very long time I, because that's... we completely forgot he was even in the building. And look, I was such a pure thing back then. When we first opened, a guy came over and was like, so I understand you. you have... And I was like, we have what? And he was like, we have... I was like, what are you saying to me, sir? And he's like, you have blue movies? blue i had no idea i was so innocent i had no idea what he meant and i was like i don't know he ended up yelling porn for christ i was horrified because then everyone's staring at us and i was like yeah it's in the back it was yeah it was a real real eye opener but yeah uh, well listen god um well listen just going through these one by one brian yeah. and sean's case there i think oh. it's interesting that the wire to the security camera was cut i feel, feel like that's a clue i mean obviously he could have said to them cut it but to me it's like that says why was that on his mind why did he know he she they know where it was yeah if the person did it what i just thought was it a disgruntled employee that was what came to mind there for me sure could be wrong um because again the fact that there was cash left in the wallets that were left it was like is this more about revenge or something than something else sure um tito marino that case uh a man covered in blood told the customer to leave the tape at the counter did that person call the police because if they didn't i'm gonna be honest shame on you shame I on don't you I don't believe they did. Yeah, that feels like, for me, if I go into an establishment and a man covered in blood says to me, just leave it there. I'm going to go, no problem. I'm going to back out. I'm going to get in my car. I'm going to drive away, but I'm going to be calling the police. Yeah. Yeah, it's just the, uh, the well, blood on his shirt and dripping from his face. I'm like, ah. Uh... Yeah, to me, it's like, that's a, I don't know, maybe just have them do a welfare check. I, I just, I don't know. Anyway. Yes. Um, maybe the person was scared. I'm not trying to shame them, but I'm just saying, see something, say something. And if the person is covered in blood, that's my thought. Sure. Um, now the next one, uh, oh, sorry. The same case rather, uh, when you were getting into the DNA tests that they found a match and that the person wasn't charged, I literally wrote down, put us in coach. We could win this case with no <laughs> lawyering training. I mean, it's a slam dunk here and I'm sorry, but if the DNA is a match, and the hat was at the crime. Yep. I'm not saying that that proves that the person did the murder, but I'm absolutely going to say you got a person of interest and yeah. people have been convicted on less. And now I'm not suggesting yes. we should convict somebody on less at all, but you know what I'm saying? I'm being glib, but I'm, but the point is, is that, oh, you know what it is? Nothing grinds my gears like injustice. It is. There it is. Yep. The biggest, I, 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 it just kills me when it's like people's, Loved ones, doesn't matter if it's anyone's loved one. A human ha has been murdered and you're not doing absolutely everything to get a conviction for the actual person who committed the crime. I can't. I can't. Yeah. It kills me. Um. Okay. Now, in case four, you brought up television psychic Sylvia Brown. Now, did you know that I was obsessed with Sylvia Brown and the Montel show and actually went to a live Sylvia Brown I don't know what you'd call it. Appearance? Event? event? Oh, I did not know that. I so, did see your eyes sparkle when I said Sylvia. Oh, yeah. Brown. I was like, Sylvia. So, friend of the podcast, Leslie Seiler, and her father had tickets to go see Sylvia Brown at this convention of some sort that was happening in Toronto. This would have been, oh my gosh, probably the early 2000s. Uh, Seiler was not able to attend, so I actually went in her place. I used her ticket. I went with her dad, and we went to that's, this event. That's charming. It was very fun. Uh but Sylvia Brown, I mean, for those who don't know, just give her a Google and, and uh, it, they'll tell you everything you need to know. She has a very deep voice. She was like always smoking cigarettes. It felt oh. like, you know, always in a, a bright moo moo that I love. Oh, um, I respect that. But what I remember taking away from that event was you could ask her a question and she'd give you like a reading on the fly. But I remember someone said to her, um, 
no question, just anything you, whatever you want to tell me. And she got mad and she's like, it doesn't work that way. You need to ask me a question. And that was when I was like, is she real? But then when the COVID thing came out, I was like, what are the chances? I pray she's wrong about the 10 year thing. She has to be. We well, I also don't it. know that I would Just... say that it mer mer mysteriously disappeared as quickly as it came. I also feel like that's not sure. necessarily 100% correct. Sure. It's just the accuracy of the year. Yes. And like a bronchial or however she described oh, it. Oh, yeah. No, it's it's wild. But again, I'm just trying that, to poke holes in it because I don't want her to be right about the 10 year well, thing. Well, it just, again, somebody said, is my son alive? They said, no. And then he was found alive. That was actually, I remember that case too. That was such a, I mean, such a crazy case, but... Then I wrote down, Ahoy, Captain, one of my favorite things you've said on this show. <laughs> um, yeah, and then regarding the Miranda Fenner case, uh, I love that a man confessed, but the police just didn't believe him. And to that I say, and then it ended up being him. To that I say, well, he didn't bring any information that wasn't already publicly known. Maybe, how did you question him? How much time? We know yeah. that, that the police will question people for 16, 18 hours, no breaks, c causing um, false confessions to happen. And this man's coming in, actually confessing to a crime we, of course, know now he absolutely committed. And you just didn't buy it. I don't know. Every yeah. time I hear, there's, every time I think there's nothing you could tell me on this show that would shock me, I'm proven wrong. Because that to me is just like, I don't understand how that could happen. When again, it's so easy to get a false confession. Yeah, I can't. Um, This detail, again, my bugaboo being hating injustice the detail that these people were accidentally released from prison due to a software glitch mm -hmm. and that it wasn't that it was like a real problem it was just that management kind of misprioritized things that yeah. is something that will haunt me till the day i die um yep. case six patricia webb nebraska did you say one of the stolen items was a calculator i absolutely did now, do we know what kind of calculator? Was it a graphing calculator? Was this an expensive calculator? Oh, I don't know, but I just assume that's you an could, you could make it say boobs or shell oil. That's the Thank only you thing very I... much for that. This now listen, psychologist hat on. Yes. This is an interesting detail to me. Because what that feels like to me is somebody who's grabbing things to make it look like a robbery. Because oh. no person is like, you know what I got to steal? That calculator. They're not a high ticket item. Even an expensive calculator is not going to get you, you, you're not gonna be able to sell that in a pawn shop and get a ton of money. So that was when the first thing, the first like alarm bell went off to me that I was like, this is a psychologist hat case. The second was that she was naked with no signs of a sexual assault. Her yep. clothes were never found, but she was wrapped in a coat. Now, I know enough about profiling to be able to tell you that was earnest. And I mean it. I, I know, do. And, I... and you know what? I'm not going to back down. I do. I do. I've done a lot of what reading. You do. I'm good at what I do. I do happen to know a lot about it. I'm not saying I'm schooled in it. I'm not an expert. But from what I know, if a body is found in that kind of way, typically it's because the person has either a familial type relationship to the person sure. and they feel bad in the moment and they have to protect the person by covering them or it's someone, the, the killer is, well, maybe not that closely related to the person. There is a sense of like wanting to protect them. So, because quite sure. often, as we know, unfortunately, when we talk about cases, naked bodies, uh, unfortunately, especially of, of women are found all the time and they're not, you know, covered up. They're not, you know, um, they're hidden, but only to be difficult to find. The, the detail of putting a garment over someone who is naked, it that's a huge clue in terms of like building a profile, in my sure. opinion. Um, the fact also that she does have this ex, not that I'm saying it's the ex, but that is something to me to look at because the fact that she was also not assaulted is a huge clue as well. Now, I know that we later get into finding out she was this informant and that it feels like because she was doing court the next day, this had something to do with that. But to me, sure. that still plays into this profile I'm building because it says to me that the person was killing her out of necessity and felt guilt. That it was sure. like, you know, the clothes being taken, 
I don't know. That at first feels like a trophy situation, but then I just wonder, was it a case of the person, you know, I like to write a story. She gets taken out into the middle of nowhere. The person is threatening her. Like, you're not going to show up in court tomorrow, whatever. Take off your clothes. I'm going to leave you here basically for dead. And I'm going to take sure. your clothes so that, you know, whatever. Um, and then things escalate. She fights back and she gets killed. And then the killer then places a garment over them, over her. What's interesting is, again, that there were so few of these coats and they were never able to find the person. Because think about yeah. that. The person gave their own coat or a coat that was, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just, yeah. to me, that is where, that that's the smoking gun. That's the thing that blows it all open. It is it is the placing of that coat and then and then finding, find everybody who had one of the coats. Yeah. Again, this is where we would start. This is where I would start. Um, yeah, I don't know. To me, ultimately, it just feels like it was a, it was a, it felt like the killer felt like they had a necessity to kill her and didn't typically, didn't actually like it or want to do it. That's, that's where I would start. Sure. Um, okay. K7, the one in Hawaii. Now, this was the one where the bondage magazines were stolen, correct? The one that in wasn't, Hawaii? I, that was the one, uh, before well, that. Oh, okay. Well, what a, what an odd coincidence. Um, only because this person, uh, the serial killer that we later talked about had this bondage. Um, yes. Uh, yes, affinity. So I was just like, oh, that's, that's interesting. And then I was like, I think that was the case before, but anyway, I, well, and I was again, right. There was so many that I'm like, uh, no, I'm pretty sure it was the Nebraska one. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I just love that the employees of the next door business kicked down the door. They were like, something's up. We're going in. Oh, I like I that, love that energy. Yeah. I love that energy. Um, now, a couple of things. The detail of this serial killer, which I know is not the case that we were talking about, but it's, it's again, it was another one where my psychologist hat started to scream at me. I find it fascinating that this person had an MO where he wanted to have sex with the women that he was with, his ex-wife and his girlfriend, with their hands tied behind their back. Right. Um obviously that's a dominant uh situation and that on its own you know whatever but when you add in that anytime he and his girlfriend would fight he would leave the house and all of those times lined up with when those women were murdered and you know there could be the argument that it's like uh, whatever to me it's like this is a person who if we if we are to believe that it was him obviously um hates women so much that the fact that he had a woman, his girlfriend fighting with him, it enraged him so deeply that he had to go and act out punishing a woman in like the, the ultimate worst way. That's what that screams to me. Yeah. Dark, chilling, terrifying. And then this, this story of that other serial killer who killed and then got out early and then got manslaughter and then got out early again and then killed the third time, even after he had checked himself into a mental hospital. I just think, and I know we've talked about this on the show before. I think if you murder someone and you, you, you serve the time that you're given and you get out and then you murder again, I think it's a two strike system. In my opinion, it's over. Yeah. You've murdered two humans. I think it's done yeah. now. I think now it's, it's life in prison, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, the fact I, that I'd love to live in a world where you murder someone once. And hey, it's like, I do. That's I love stay. that. Listen, I love that too. But I'm what I'm saying is, is that in a system that is flawed, where that doesn't always happen, I just think the second sure. time, it's, it's over. over. Yeah, yeah. I don't care if it's manslaughter. Like we, you can step away from baseball rules. We don't have to worry about three <laughs> strikes. It can be two. You. It can Thank be two. You. Yeah, it's brutal. Um, oh my God. Yeah. It just, it just, again, every time I don't think I'm going to hear something that will shock me on this show. I do. Uh, when we were talking about case 13 and I don't know why it took me this long, but it's the one in Alabama, you mentioned 2002 and what immediately I thought to myself was 
Well, that wasn't that long ago. Were there video stores still in 2002? That was 20 plus years ago. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's, yep. it's look, yep. if you, if you like gun to my head, you were like, yep. Hey, 20 years ago, what year was it? I'm immediately going to go, uh, 91. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Easy. Easy. hundred percent. And then this last case, I just have to very quickly comment because that was incredible that this man was stealing product yep. to then rent out at his own store, yep. which he did get away with for whatever amount of time. Maybe not that long, he but did. he did get away with it for a little bit of time. I have so many questions. Were these video games and, and videos and whatnot, DVDs, whatever, in new packaging? Or did he just leave them in blockbuster packaging? Like, I want to know, like, how oh. deep this went. But the fact that he stole shelving, I'm like, this is a, this is like, it feels like this man's dream was to have his own video store and he was yeah. going to like damn the man to do it, which on one hand is like kind of funny to me, but then on the other hand is not because again, it is connected to to death, which I don't care for. Um, but you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I just, and I mean, this is just who I am now, but how jank was that store if he stole shelving from a bunch of different stores <laughs> to make his store? And it's like he put all his money into renting the space. Yeah. And then was like, well, I don't have money for product. I know what I'll do. 10 to 14 robberies later, that's where he's getting his product. And I'll say this. Maybe it's smart to keep stealing from the same business like the same type of business because then everything's going to look similar enough. But right. assuming like Blockbuster absolutely would have. They see they were our, they were our nemesis. <laughs> of course. You, you've they got the only, inside scoop here. Of, of course. course. Cause they were only like uh, a couple blocks away from us. Um, but uh, oh, even our tapes had these security tags on them. That would be, of course, if you go through the thing, um, but trying to peel one of those off, nightmare. Right. So it's like how, and like each tape had a tag on it that's like stickers on the physical tape itself that was like, this is property of this video store. So how much time did he take? Did he just like Sharpie it out? Did he try and peel these off or did he just leave them? And people just accepted that video 18 or whatever he called it is just kind of like a secondhand store. And if you're secondhand, great. They sell like secondhand videotapes for so cheap. But he was well, like, no, 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 no. We want we want the new releases, the new product. And but that wasn't his vision. How long are you in that store that you also get shelving? I, that's one that maybe he stole it. Could it have been getting thrown out? I don't know. But like, I just want to look into that man's mind. I want to know if it yes. was like, this was all revenge based because he was a disgruntled employee or was this his life's dream? He was like, no, I want a simple video store and I'm going to do anything I can to get it. Like, I don't know. That, to me, that's, that's the story that I write. Of course. I like the idea of him just being like, it's my dream. I yeah. lean more towards, you're going to fire me? Well, guess what? I'm going to make my own store. It's going to be better than this piece of garbage, which and also feels gets everything from just store. such a level of delusion. Oh, yeah. I just again, I want to see what those tapes look like. What was the condition? Did you yeah. did you just literally write over Blockbuster with a Sharpie video 18? Why didn't you call yourself like Blockbusto or something? So it's like similar. Yeah, so you just have to change a couple of letters. I just I have so many questions. Um specifically about that man yeah but like looking through all of it i was like are there any crimes from this and of course i'm sure so many got robbed that never made news but this one in particular the amount of robbery that this man did to feed his own store i <laughs> it's just wild and yeah he owned the store for about a year before he got caught a year yeah. You know, when some people tell this story, he might be described as a Robin Hood. You know what I'm saying? Hey. Um, Christy Oxborough, a fantastic work as always. Really, truly, I, I love the episodes that you curate. I'm deeply impressed always. And we thank you for your work, your time, your energy, and your enthusiasm. Well, look, I have such a hard, hard nostalgia for video stores. I love it. Which I hadn't really considered. Um, but 
as soon as I heard something about a video store, I was like, I absolutely want to, so I can prattle on. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I chose the word prattle on, but this is this is where we're at. These are the kind of synopses that I write now that my brain has been vegified. Vegified? Careful. That's not right. Vegas. And Vegasification. Fuck. No, I'm done. <laughs> We're good. I'm going to pull us out of this. <laughs> good. Good. Thank God. <laughs> and thank you, dear listeners, for coming along on this chaotic journey with us. We're so grateful for your support and that you stick with us and stick by us. Even when we get a little cuckoo bananas, it means a lot to us. And we're so glad that you're here. If you haven't already, give us a follow on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at True Crime and Quack. True Crime and Cocktails, Doing not Quacktails. <laughs> Almost sounded like Quacktails, and then that's about ducks. Move, pull out of the swerve. We have a duck on Twitter podcast on Twitter at Not Detectives. If you'd like some more content, we're going to record a Patreon episode right now. I'm probably going to talk about Orlando Bloom on that. Go to hey. patreoncom slash Cocktails to learn more about our subscription-based service over there. And of course, the only place to get official True Crime and Cocktails merch is TrueCrewMerch.com. So check that out as well, if you're interested. Christy, do you want to tell the people about next week's episode? And when I say the title, I mean it this time. Yep. <laughs> what, a, what a gift I give giving something special and unexpected. On the next True Crime and Cocktails, Missing Queensland. That's right. The next in our missing series of episodes of the show, which of course is new to this season of the show. So I am very excited about that. Cannot wait to learn more then. Christy, do you want to say goodnight to the people? Good night, Orlando Bloom. Good night, Vegas strippers. <laughs>